Hi everyone, thanks for watching and welcome to Past Physiology Review of Topic 1. We'll be focusing on the extracellular matrix, notable in quantity in connective tissue. Okay, so we're really talking about connective tissue here. A quick review of connective tissue, the cells are loosely dispersed within the tissue. Between the cells we have the extracellular matrix. The extracellular matrix is composed of various fibers and this gelatinous goo medium called ground substance. We'll cover these two things in detail going forward. And lastly, talk a little bit about interstitial or extracellular fluid. Please note that connective tissue is highly vascular, the, thus the red color of the row. And we'll be looking at our textbook, chapter 5 of the 13th edition of Junkiera. Let's look at table 1 and uh, figure 2 to get started here. This is generally what we're talking about. When we're looking at connective tissue, we've got fibers running through it. We have ground substance. This little box right here shows that this kind of pale color, whatever this background color is, okay, whatever you see this color to be, periwinkle, I don't know, pink, light pink, rose, all this stuff, everything between the shapes and the lines is ground substance. It is water, ground substance is water bound up to sugar, essentially, okay, um, along with electrolytes like sodium and potassium. We've, we see various uh, fibers, we see elastic fibers and collagen fibers and reticular fibers from the collagen as well. We see blood vessels running through the tissue, we see cells, and we see a variety of cells. These different shaped blobs are different cells. You don't need to know too many specifics about the different types of cells for this, but we will mention them a little bit so you, uh, so you have a, a, a base understanding when you come across these terms in class and as you're reading. So. The extracellular matrix in the picture should match up with our text over here, right? We've got ground substance, fibers, okay, protein fibers, elastic and collagen fibers. They're all formed out of protein, okay? So they're all fibers. And then um, the other component here that's not in this uh, illustration is interstitial fluid, which is in connective tissue. But please note that extracellular matrix does not include extracellular fluid, okay? ECM, extracellular matrix, is just fibers and ground substance, okay? So there are three overarching components of connective tissue, cells, matrix, and fluid, okay? Cells, matrix, and fluid. Cells, matrix, and fluid, and the matrix sounds complicated because it is. It's combined of multiple things. It's a matrix of fibers and ground substance, okay? That's what we're gonna be diving into going forward. This table illustrates fiber types, what they are made of, okay, so the names of the fiber type, the type of uh, collagen fiber that they're made of, except for elastin, okay, proteins and elastin fibers make up elastic, but basically this is all what type of collagen makes up the fiber type. And then the locations in the body, where they're found, and what they're like. The last column is the function and characteristics, uh, notable things about the fiber type. We've got a few uh, memory tools and images and things uh, that we can use to help us recall this stuff. And we've got a clinical note in green at the bottom about vitamin C deficiency that I promise you is going to come up in multiple classes and probably multiple questions on multiple board exams. This concept of vitamin C deficiency leading to scurvy, which is due to impaired collagen formation uh, because of the absence of the coenzyme ascorbic acid, which is a coenzyme for the hydroxylation of proline and lysine. You don't need to know maybe this much detail for this class, but you might as well just learn this now because it's coming up in uh, biochemistry, nutrition, maybe histology, certainly pathology, general diagnosis, okay, all those different classes can, can ask these types of questions, can ask this question uh, in those sections and boards as well. Okay, so you're going to have bleeding gums and, uh, you know, basically your tissues fall apart. Okay, your tissues fall apart and you bleed. 
It also uh, is going to affect organs that are high in type 3 uh, connective tissue, filtering type organs, connective or uh, kidneys, spleen, lymph nodes, and bone marrow. Okay, so now that we've got that random clinical note out of the way, we're going to get into the uh, nitty gritty with numbers and names. Okay, so Table 5.3 and figure 5.11 are going to show us a little bit about fibrillar collagen. So I'm going to get there in the text right here. Um, actually, before we get there, here's a little table. You could pause this You could pause this video at any time, you guys, and read the textbook uh, off the video because there's more details that I'm talking about. The more you read this textbook, the more you learn, but you can also you know, get lost in, in more details than you'll be tested on. So... You know, I advise you just kind of for sure look at every table and, and uh, figure in the book. Look at all the pictures. Look at the captions to the pictures. Um, anytime you see a word that you remember from class or a word, a term that you see in your textbook, read about it. And if you see a term that is certainly not in your, in your notes, then maybe kind of skip over that just to save time, okay? Uh, this table here is not really testable, um, but it's something that you should know for some background so you know what these words are when you come across them. But this is just about different types of cells in connective tissue. So fibroblasts, okay, anytime you come across this word blast or blastic activity, this means the, the creation of something, making something, okay? So fibroblasts, blast means to build or to make, okay, that B, just think build, builders. Fibro builders, they're fiber builders, okay? You can also call them fibrocytes, the word site attached to any word just means cell. So site means cell. So when you see this word lymphocytes, it, it, it's, uh, it basically means lymphatic cell. Okay? So fibroblasts are found in connective tissue. They, the major product or activity, they make fibers. Okay? Some of them also make ground substance, uh, which we'll talk about later on when we get down here. Plasma cells are B cells that make antibodies. Lymphocytes... Uh, they're an immune cell, you know, functioning within the lymphatic system. Uh, any type of leukocyte is another white blood cell involved with immunity. Um, these are all, basically these three are all immune cells. You don't need to know details, but neutrophils and macrophages, they're, they're both white blood cells that gobble up uh, things that are not supposed to be in the body. Phagocytosis means the, the eating of cells. Cytosis refers to cell phage, okay, or phago, this means to eat, okay, phage uh, means eat, basically, okay, this is all Greek word origins here, Greek etymology, if you ever want to know what a word means, Google the word plus the term etymology, okay, if I do this, we go to google.com, Type in, that's Google Maps. Okay, I'm just going to do it in the bar here. Etymology. The study of the origin of words. Okay, so if you type in any word plus this one, you'll get these different online etymology dictionaries. Super handy, especially if you don't have a great background in medical terminology. Um, this is a great way to learn what, what words mean, what words literally mean. Uh, because a lot of medical terminology is going to uh, be found uh, within different types of words, okay? So macrophages are like a real classic immune system cell that eats things. So they're going to be eating garbage, basically, in tissue. Uh, and they also do other stuff that you'll get into in immunology class. Um, they secrete, basically, uh, cytokines, okay, to, to make other immune cells do their job, okay? But forget about that. Just know phagocytosis is the eating up of stuff, okay? And neutrophils are going to eat bacteria. Macrophages also eat bacteria. Uh, mast cells are another immune system cell. And adipocytes, okay, store fat. So adipose tissue is fat tissue. Adipocytes are fat cells, okay? This is a nice basic background because uh, some of these terms are going to come up throughout the course. And in all of the, you know, all these terms are going to come up eventually. So we might as well just get you off with a good uh, a footing, a good start, okay? So back to where we were going, which is table 5-3 in the text. We come down here. Table 5-3. There we go. This has way more details than you need, but it will have 
uh, all the different types of collagen fibers plus some and it's going to have details you don't need like the the size of the structure um, you don't need to know the molecule composi composition you don't need to know what it looks like under a microscope but if you want to come back to this table um, then you can review where things are found uh, and the major you know function if you want to uh, because that can help you remember that can basically help you remember locations perhaps okay so something that's resistant uh, to pressure okay is gonna you know that makes sense that that would be in uh, cartilage which resists pressure okay in, in your joints um, and in the vitreous uh, body of the of the eye that's something you'll get into later uh, resistance to tension right type one the big the major one is gonna be found uh, in things that get torqued on a lot like skin and tendon and bone okay also in your teeth so I'm not gonna go over this but if you want to come to this later I've noted it here for you otherwise we're gonna go to figure 511 to look at a picture this is just a uh, a picture of a you know a little piece of collagen a collagen subunit um, it is kinda like a rope okay it's like a rope made out of protein alright we'll keep it that simple you can get more into detail if you want but it's wrapped up like this in like a little rope or a little string. And come down to 511. And we've got uh, the larger complex of collagen. It's really basically formed like rope. Rope is lots of little twiny deals wound up and then bigger uh, strings wound up together. Um, it's basically a bunch of fibers bundled up, okay? So if you want to get into this a little bit more detail, that's what um, collagen looks like, I guess. But otherwise, we can use this table and kind of focus on this table because I've got uh, the tools for you in here. So reticular fibers um, are going to be made out of type 3 collagen. And there is a type of fibrillar collagen that will also be made out of type 3. Otherwise, there will be no overlap that you have to remember Okay, as far as numbers go. It's pretty straightforward. Fibrillar collagen... Fat, one, two, three. Fibular fat, one, two, three. Conveniently, the biggest, uh, thickest, and most common type of collagen is type one. It's number one. It's number one most common. It's number one most big, okay? Fat, one, two, three. These are the big boys. Fat, one, two, three. Fat fibrillar collagen, one, two, three. Uh, they are strong, okay, they're, they're big, so that would make sense if they're found in places where you have strong attachments and tough coverings. Uh, strong attachments would be tendons and ligaments and tough coverings like the dura uh, of the CNS and capsules around organs and also in your bones. That's not noted in your notes, um, or they haven't been in the past, but uh, type 1, especially collagen uh, or fibrillar collagen in general, is going to be found in bones. Now on to reticular uh, reticular fibers are going to be comprised of type 3 collagen and you see in front of you a red tricycle reticular red tricycle a tricycle has three wheels reticular sounds like red everything in here is red okay so red tricycle red reticular tricycle for three type 3 collagen, red tricycle. It's going to be found in uh, basically filtering type organs in the body. And I mentioned etymology a few minutes ago. And the etymology of the word reticular refers to net-like. Okay, and so this is really, really helpful. If you, if you know that reticular means net-like, that's going to help you remember that reticular fibers are going to be found in places where a net would come in handy, like filtering organs like the liver, spleen, lymph nodes, and red bone marrow. And maybe you don't know that that's the function of these, um, but maybe to keep it simple, okay, blood filters through your spleen, uh, and lymph filters through, filters through lymph nodes. Your liver process, you know, your liver filters, uh, you know, all of your blood and does a 499 other things too. And then your red bone marrow, uh, it needs, you know, you need, you need to be able to move uh, red, you know, cell, bone cells through it uh, and hold back whatever's not supposed to be getting through as well. Okay, so 
It's a net like connective uh, or net 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 like fiber, and so the function could be described as a flexible scaffolding, right? Almost like a net. It allows filtration and easy passage of uh, small things through it. The fibers are very thin. Uh, it's a fine net. It's also associated with scurvy, as I mentioned at the beginning. Now on to number four. The type four collagen is going to be uh, handily creating network forming okay, fiber types. So network forming fiber types, there's a thing called the network forming collagen fiber. Okay, I put C here to remind us that this is network forming collagen. Network forming, just say network four, as in the number four, and you've got your fiber type. It's, made, it's comprised mostly of type four collagen. And the fourth letter of the alphabet is D, A, B, C, D. Lamina densa is where we find this as a specific special location. The lamina D densa, one, two, three, four. Type four collagen network forming fibers. That all lines up nice and clean. So these are ultra thin uh, fibers in a network type configuration, kind of like reticular, but it's a lot finer, a lot smaller. And you might recall that it's smaller because we come up here. This is a this is a small space here. Okay, um, the basement membrane is a is a thin layer between you know a, a row of epithelial cells and then you know the connective tissue below it. So it's small. All right, if that helps you understand it better. Now getting into this purple row here, we talked a little bit about linking, anchoring L7 type 7 collagen forming uh, the bond between the basal lamina of the epithelium and the reticular lamina of the connective tissue below within the basement membrane. Okay, this is what we're getting into. This link anchor type 7 collagen L7, uh, L7, right? Linking, anchoring type 7 collagen. Where is it found? It's in the extracellular matrix linking uh, fibrillar collagens to other stuff. Linking and anchoring, it links fibrillar collagen to other stuff in the extracellular matrix. I suppose that makes sense if it's linking anchoring and it links stuff together within the ECM. Okay, that just makes sense. And then in the basement membrane, we just talked about it. It's basically, it's, it is the tiny, it's the smallest connecting point, right, between the epithelium and connective tissue. So between the basal lamina and the reticular lamina, all right? And it's in purple because it's what is between the blue epithelium and the red connective tissue, all right? So you've got L7, you've got the color purple, um, and you've got this term, you got the word link, all right? So if you see that word linking, linking things together, linking anchoring type seven is a pretty good guess. Uh, elastic fiber types are made out of elastin, uh, this elastin is only going to be found in elastic fiber. Super easy. Probably won't be asked about because it's too easy. Um, it's going to be found in loose connective tissues as opposed to dense and tough connective tissues. That makes sense. These up here, fibular collagen, when I'm talking about, uh, you know, tendons and dura and things like that, those are certainly dense connected tissues uh, as opposed to elastic, stretchy, that's loose. Loose connective tissue also, elastic connected tissue and elastic cartilage. Certainly, that's where it's going to be found. So, I added the word duh here. And the function is elasticity or stretchy recoil. If we go to figure 15, it's kind of cool to see how uh, these things are arranged. Uh, the molecular basis of elastic fiber elasticity on the top here is what um, elastic tissue looks like when there's no stress stretching it out. It's a bunch of really uh, kind of random crazy cross links with kind of extra um, slack basically built into it so that it's a balled up network of stuff with a bunch of cross links. And then when you stress it out and, and tug it, it has the ability to uh, unwind um, out of this kind of weird random coil, okay, type of shape. These cross links... Okay, is kind of what we're talking about when we have this uh, vitamin C deficiency. Um, you don't get these proper cross-linkings 
uh, when you're missing vitamin C. Okay, so that's kind of what scurvy ties into. You, you don't get this proper formation with these strong cross links. So, uh, yeah. So anyway, moving on, we're going to get into ground substance. And this can be a bear, but we're going to make it as easy as possible. The text covers it on page 113. I put a big star on it in my PDF version here. Because it's worth reading, there are a few terms that you don't need to necessarily know. And there are some details like the molecular weight of hyaluronic acid. You don't need to know that weight, but you need to know that it's big. You need to know that it's huge. Uh, otherwise, I highly recommend pausing the video and reading, uh, reading what you can see on here. Okay, And better yet, read it in your own book. Um, so what we've got is a table that is three rows. These are the three big parts of ground substance. Glycosaminoglycans, which you call them, which we just call them GAGs. When I say GAG, that means glycosaminoglycan. Okay, glyco, okay, amino, glycan, sugar, protein, sugar. All right, it's basically sugar. It's mostly sugar. It's a huge long chain of sugar. It's a long linear polysaccharide. It's really big. It's also the most common. GAG or glycosaminoglycan in the body. It's super important. Make sure that you uh, make sure that you really understand every bit of this table. Now, proteoglycans are made of GAGs and a protein. Okay, so what we have is uh, a core protein. I'm going to go to the table here so we can see this while we're talking about it. This is a nice illustration uh, to basically lay out everything that's in here, okay? So hyaluronic acid on this table is this huge, long polysaccharide sugar chain. Long chain of sugar, it's huge. And then this picture chooses to show proteoglycan complexes bound onto hyaluronic acid. So by itself, Hyaluronic acid or hyaluronin or hyaluronate, all the same thing. Hyaluronic acid is just this huge long sugar chain. And then separately, what this is, I'm even going to draw a circle around it. This, and that's way too thick, so I'm going to thin that out. Sorry about that. This is the proteoglycan complex, okay? A proteoglycan is a protein core, which is blue on this picture. This is protein. It's a protein core. It's a protein rod. And then bound onto the protein rod are a whole bunch of glycosaminoglycans. Bound onto that protein rod are sulfated glycosaminoglycans that I have not talked about yet. Okay. Now... This is what gives us the bottle brush, quote unquote, bottle brush arrangement. If you don't know what a bottle brush is, just Google it so I don't have to try to explain it to you, but it's a brush that brushes out bottles. All right, so coming back to the GAGs or the glycosaminoglycans, you have five GAGs total that you need to deal with, okay? But you have basically two types of GAGs. You have hyaluronic acid and you have Sulfated gags, okay? Sulfated gags are attached to protein rods to form proteoglycans. There are four types of sulfated gags that you need to know these words and be able to rattle them off. Chondroitin sulfate, keratin sulfate, dermatin sulfate, and heparin sulfate. Be able to rattle these off and list them because you probably have to list them for a test question or at least know them, okay? Chondroitin, keratin, dermatin, heparin, sulfate. These are the sulfated gags. There are four sulfated gags, chondroitin, keratin, dermatin, sulf dermatin, and heparin sulfate. These, what they do is they get bound up to protein rods. When they are bound up to a protein rod, they form these, proteoglycans. You co could call it a proteoglycan complex if that helps you remember that it's kind of, you know, multiple things going on. It's a whole bunch of sugar and a little bit of protein. So in gray, I put that more sugar than protein. So now coming over here to the function, what the proteoglycan does, 
essentially it binds water. So do gags though, okay? So gags, gag on salt water is our thing here. If you've ever taken a gulp of salt water swimming in the ocean, I bet you gagged, and if you didn't, there's something wrong with you, okay? Gag, salt water's nasty. So you gag on salt water. Glycosamine and glycans is just, what they're doing is binding up lots of water along with salt. Salt follows water in the body. Salt and water go together, okay? So what gags do is they bind sodium and potassium and therefore water. They are incredibly hydrophilic. Know this word, philic, okay, going back to Greek etymology. Philic or a thyle with a PH, that means that you like something, okay? Like a pedophile, okay, it means pediatrics is right, children, right? Peds, kids. File means to like. So pedophiles, right, are sexually attracted to children. Uh, that's what those words mean, okay? Um, hydro means water, of course, right? So hydrophilic means it's water loving. So gags love water. Gag on salt water, though, because more specifically, they're binding sodium, potassium, and water. You could just say electrolytes and water, but you should, you know, know that it's sodium and potassium especially. So what happens then is that by binding up all this water, they're kind of making a water bed. They're making a cushion. Uh, and it's not just straight water, really. When it binds up all this, when sugar binds this water, think of it making kind of like syrup, okay? If you've ever uh, made simple syrup, you know, working behind a bar or something, um, it is, you know, simple syrup is just your hot water with sugar added to it, and it makes that, uh, it makes that kind of a little th thicker than water because the sugar is, uh, you know, dissolved into it, okay, bound into it. So, you know, think of a water bed. Gag on salt water, um, electrolytes and water fill up this space with something like a water bed, but it's a thicker type of a medium than water itself. And so then essentially, this cushion, this gelatinous goo, this simple syrup type of mixture uh, is going to be binding and containing uh, basically everything in extracellular matrix. Uh, and it's also going to have the function of, you know, allowing um, some diffusion uh, of, of products and nutrients through it. And it's going to be pushing out and keeping out bacteria and stuff like that as well. These gags also, you know, bind fibers and cell integrins. Uh, and cell integrins are just um, basically little, little things that, connect the inside of a cell with the outside world of a cell, okay? So coming back down here to a proteoglycan, proteoglycan is the protein core with a bunch of sulfated gags attached to it. There are four sulfated gags. This table only shows you two, okay, because different proteoglycans in different parts of the body may only have one or two types of sulfated gag in that proteoglycan complex. And then this shows you chondroitin sulfate, keratin sulfate, and then hyaluronin. But notice that this arrow, okay, um, is pointing over here to this. So this is hyaluronin, okay. And then this says sulfated gags, but this, there should be a little arrow here. Let me draw you an arrow. Sulfated gags, these are sulfated gags, all right. And then this is hy hyaluronin. Okay, um, so keratin sulfate, maybe this is keratin sulfate, and maybe this one is chondroitin sulfate, okay? So now, coming back to the proteoglycan, it's this bottle brush. The bottle brush, the handle of the brush is the protein. The, the bristles of the brush are sulfated gags. What are the sulfated gags? List them off, get get fluid with this, be able to say these words, chondroitin sulfate, keratin sulfate, dermatin sulfate, heparin sulfate. Those form proteoglycans. And what proteoglycans do is essentially they attach gags to bind up lots of water to create ground substance. GS component, okay, so the word ground substance, GS, right? This whole table is ground substance. And notice that the first two rows are blue. Think about that. Why would I make Glycosamine and glycans and proteoglycans blue. I made them blue because the whole concept is that they're binding up lots and lots of water. Gags and proteoglycans bind up lots and lots of water. 
proteoglycans have gags in them. Gags bind the salt water. Proteoglycans are a bunch of gags, but just connected by a protein. Actually, I should say proteoglycans are sulfated gags stuck together on a protein. So they're all binding water because gags bind water. Gag on salt water. Proteoglycans also bind signaling proteins, thus the little phone type of signal thing here, just giving you some type of picture. Um, and specifically, uh, fibroblast growth factor. So connected onto these, you know, use your imagination. Somewhere you have some little thing, okay, a little, <laughs> a little protein basically attached to a proteoglycan, you know, in different parts of the body. And if this proteoglycan falls apart due to, you know, just decomposition, tissue death, uh, abnormality, whatever, if Mr. Proteoglycan falls apart, then that is going to make something fall apart uh, that connects to fibroblast growth factor. So basically, it's going to, fibroblast growth factor is going to know when Mr. Proteoglycan fell apart because he's attached to him. And so if Mr. if Mr. Proteoglycan falls apart in the body, Mr. Fibroblast Growth Factor is connected to him and he goes, okay, I'm gonna build some more fibers uh, and start rebuilding this tissue, okay? That's what this is about, signaling proteins. Now coming over here to this example, you guys, this whole, please understand that the examples, okay, column here, is talking about it, like literally names Examples of names of, okay, the thing on the left side. So examples of glycosaminoglycans are hyaluronic acid, the big one, the most common in the body, the biggest gag in the body. Um, also, I kind of skipped over this, but this is essential for basically lubrication in, in joints. If you see something about a joint uh, in the body, we're we're probably you know you gotta be you gotta be looking for hyaluronic acid in your answer choice. Um, and also potentially chondroitin sulfate uh, is associated with joints as well, but especially hyaluronic acid. So those are GAGs. And then agrican and syndican are proteoglycans, okay? Sometimes um, in the notes it can be a little bit confusing because you don't, you know, quite get it, but agrican just is a type of, you know, is a proteoglycan. Syndican is a proteoglycan. They're just different arrangements. Agrican might have... Dermatin and keratin and syndican might have chondroitin and heparin. Okay, that's I'm randomly just throwing up ideas, but that's what what this is talking about. And if you think about it, proteoglycan, agrican, proteoglycan, can, syndican. They sound like the word proteoglycan. So if that helps you, proteoglycan, agrican, syndican sound the same. But you say, wait. Glycosaminoglycan. Wouldn't that be confusing because glycosaminoglycan ends in can? So I don't want to just remember can, agrican. Oh, I could get that confused with glycosaminoglycan. But no, you won't because you know the gags. You have to know the gags, okay? You know that the gags, there are five gags. There are only two types of gags. There are hyaluronic acid and there are sulfated gags. Hyaluronic acid and the sulfated gags and the sulfated gags are chondroitin, keratin, dermatin, and heparin sulfate. So you're not gonna you're not gonna make that mistake because you know the gags. Okay, you might not remember the names of the proteoglycans, but you can you can guess because you see can can proteoglycan. Now, coming down to glycoprotein, this whole row is white because I call glycoprotein glucoprotein, glucoprotein. It is mostly protein with less sugar. Come over here to the the picture. A typical glycoprotein, it is a, a globular protein arrangement with a little sugar attached to it, and it binds things together. It sticks things together. It binds fibers, and it binds cell integrins, and if we go to 519 in the te text here, figure 519, I'll show you what I mentioned before, what a cell integrin is. This is, I wish this showed the whole cell, but so this middle thing here is the cell, whoops, is the cell membrane. So really, if you think about it, um, I could draw, I could put a big circle in here to kind of show you like, really, the, there's a huge cell that it's not showing, okay? So pretend, 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna take the time to do this. Make this a little bit bigger. Make this even bigger. How about that? Okay. So this circle is the cell. Okay. It's a lot bigger than this. And in the circle is in the cell. Try to zoom in. Zoom in without freezing my computer. Okay. <laughs> so the circle is a cell. Okay. To give you an idea, uh, the book shows you the cell membrane because they're zooming in on specific stuff that you don't need to know. But the integrin is just this thing right here. It's just this rod, just this protein rod that goes from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. And this is extracellular matrix out here, okay, which has attachments uh, via gags and glycoproteins, okay, and the integrin tells the inside of the cell what's going on in the outside of the cell. That's what it's doing, okay? It's integrating integrin, it's integrating the inside of the cell with the outside of the cell. Okay, in the in the whole you know idea of this is the cell is within the extracellular matrix. So there might be fibers and stuff attaching to it, and there's all this is ground substance out here. This is your cell, integrin. Integrin integrates the cell with the outside of the cell. Okay, now examples of glycoproteins. There's only a couple that you know we've got listed here that you should know about, but it's laminin and fibronectin. And they both sound sticky, don't they? Well, let's break it down. Laminin. Okay, what laminin does, it binds epithelium to fibers in the lamina lucida of the basal lamina. Okay, well, at least you can get back to the idea that you, you can hopefully recall that the laminin is a glycoprotein because a glycoprotein is a glucoprotein because a glycoprotein sticks things together. It binds fibers together. It binds cell integrins together. Um, it binds fibers and cell integrins. So laminin, if you think about... Uh, when you laminate a piece of paper like your elementary school teacher laminated just about everything she possibly could, when she did that, she just really essentially using by hand or with a machine, she was sticking two pieces of plastic together on both sides of a piece of paper. So you, when you laminate, you stick the plastic together around the paper. Laminin is sticky. So is fibronectin. Fibronectin. Uh, what do hummingbirds drink? They drink nectar, right? They, they want to drink the nectar of flowers. And the nectar of flowers is sweet. It's got sugar in it. And if you ever have ever made, you know, like hummingbird feeder stuff, it's like sugar water. And if you make simple syrup type of sugar water, it thickens that and it's sticky. If you were to spill nectar, it would probably be sticky. Fibro nectin fiber sticky it binds collagen to the integrin of cells so those words sound sticky laminin sticky fibronectin sticky what's sticky glue glucoprotein binds fibers and cell integrins and then also this laminin is going to be binding epithelium uh, basically ep binding the lamina lucida okay so those are the components of ground substance. It's essential that you spend enough time to really get a grip on this. Um, and if you use these, you know, simple memory aids and stuff that I've talked about, it should help a lot. Think of your own as well and share them. Um, otherwise, we're going to wrap up with the, uh, you know, recap of ground substance, gags, and glycoproteins, and then a little bit about interstitial fluid. You don't need to know much about it. Okay, ground substance. It's clear, but it's thick and you know more viscous than water. It physically supports um, cells and fibers within the uh, extracellular matrix. It also regulates cell-to-cell -cell communication. Um, nutrients can pass through and waste can get out of, you know, via, slowly via diffusion through. Um, it's not just dead space. There is some transportation of materials through it. Uh, and also it does impede bacteria, you know, having access to uh, cells and whatnot. And specifically, gags that bind up electrolytes and water, you know, make this a thicker type of gel that will cushion, uh, make a waterbed kind of, right? While while binding up all this water, uh, you know, can also help block this pathogen invasion. And then glycoproteins are the glue that glue fibers to other fibers and fibers to cells. Um, and integrins are just integrating the inside of the cell with the outside of the cell, like we just talked about. 
So lastly, interstitial fluid is the third component of connective tissue. Let's look at it again in red here. Cells, ECM, and interstitial fluid. If you get a question that says, what are the three main components of connective tissue? Then it's cells, extracellular matrix, and fluid. Cells, matrix, and fluid. But if the question is, what are the components of extracellular matrix? Well, then it's fibers and ground substance. Okay? There will be cells within, you know, you know, between the extracellular matrix, but fibers and ground substance make up the matrix. They form the matrix. All of these types of fibers and all of these types of ground substance components form the matrix. So lastly, again, okay, that third component of connective tissue, interstitial fluid. What it is is a plasma, quote unquote, right, plasma filtrate fluid in connective tissue that is free and it's not bound up by gags or gags within a proteoglycan complex. It's free fluid. That's super important that you know um, because we talk about fluid so much. Gag on salt water, right? They're binding up all this water. Interstitial fluid is different. Interstitial fluid is free. It is not bound up. So what it is is it comes from your blood plasma. Uh, it's just a less protein rich because it's less protein rich than blood plasma because it has to squeeze through your blood vessel walls uh, and those little, you know, um, fenestra windows, okay, that you learn about later, the little pockets that this blood plasma squeezes through allow fluid to get through, but it, it's going to be filtering out protein because uh, protein is, you know, a lot bigger than the fluid. So normally you have very little interstitial fluid. If you have too much, it's called edema. There are many different causes and uh, usually it's not a good sign. Um, there are many, many different pathologies uh, that, you know, that cause edema. It could just be protein, or it could be a trauma, uh, burns, um, various vascular uh, disorders and things. So just know that edema is a clinical term for excess tissue fluid uh, or excess interstitial fluid. Okay, this is a little diagram kind of showing you what I just talked about. And in your book, uh, it shows you a little more complex diagram uh, of blood flowing through the arteriole going you know into the tissues into your capillaries these tiny little vessels um, and then it's comes you know gets returned back to the heart via venules which feed into veins um, and in here due to different pressures this uh, you know this plasma part of blood can get squeezed out um, into the fluids <laughs>